Okay, Brett. Let's do it. All right, great. Well, good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast, and good morning if you are on the West Coast. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Avoiding Common Capital Campaign Mistakes. My name is Stephen Shattuck, and I'm the VP of Marketing over here at Bloomerang, and I will be moderating today's discussion. And today I'm joined by our guest. He is Brent A. Hayfley, M.A. Hey there, Brent. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Sorry, Susan, I didn't mean to uh, uh, ignore the people between coasts, so if you are between coasts, also welcome to you. Uh, thanks for, for you for being here, Brent. Thanks to everyone who's joining us. This is going to be a great conversation uh, about capital campaigns. It's actually one that Brent and I have been planning, uh, it seems like, for a few months. So I've kind of had it on my calendar months out. I've been really excited about the presentation, and I had a chance to peek at the slides uh, a little bit this morning. Uh, you're all in for a treat, for sure. And for those of you who don't know Brent, uh, he provides counsel through his practice, New Day Nonprofit Solutions. Uh, working with a variety of nonprofit leadership areas, including capital campaigns, general fundraising, strategic planning, board governance relations, and vibrancy planning. Uh, as a practitioner, Brent's got some uh, boots on the ground experience. He worked in the nonprofit sector for almost 10 years, uh, serving as executive director of the Chippewa Valley Free Clinic and development director of Hope Gospel Mission, where he successfully led a capital campaign to open a women's shelter. That's great. So he's, uh, he's got some real life experience with all the things he's going to talk about. Uh, Brent also has a Master of Arts degree in Philanthropy and Development from St. Mary's University of Minnesota. He's a faculty member of the University of St. Thomas's Fundraising Certificate Series, uh, where he actually teaches courses on capital campaigns and nonprofit marketing. Uh, he's also a regular speaker, speaker at national, regional, and local conferences on nonprofit leadership. So Brent, this is a real treat to have you. Thanks again for taking you know, an hour or so out of your day to share all your knowledge with us. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to you about uh, really a passion of mine, uh, capital campaigns, and, and yeah. talk a little bit more about uh, how to really propel nonprofit organizations further and, and help them grow forward, and that's something that uh, I'm, I'm really all about. So thank you. I appreciate it, Stephen. Yeah, I can definitely tell you are. Um, well, good. I'm not going to take up too much time. I, I know I want to get Brent started on the presentation. Just, to, just to some house cleaning uh, items. I will be sending out the slides and a recording of the presentation uh, a little bit later on in the present uh, uh, this afternoon. So look for an email from me with all those resources. So if you have to leave early or perhaps you want to revisit some of the content, you'll be able to do that. Um, and as Brent's presenting, please do feel free to send some questions through the chat box there. Uh, we're going to stick around for a Q&A session at the end where uh, Brent's going to be here as, a, as an expert for, for you to answer any and all questions you have. So don't be shy. Send any questions our way and we'll get to those a little bit later on in the presentation. So Brent, uh, why don't you take it away? All right. Let's get to it. So today I want to talk to you about uh, capital campaigns and specifically uh, I want to share with you four common mistakes that I found that uh, nonprofits make on a regular basis. And, and avoiding these four mistakes is, is really a, a solid way to make sure that your campaign has a higher likelihood of success. And so today's agenda, we're going to start with what is a capital campaign? And, and what are the different variations of that? And then from there, we're going to talk about those four mistakes and then how to fix them. Some strategies for that. And then we're going to have lots of time for questions and answers. And so you'll see in your screen there's a chat box, and I encourage you throughout the webinar to send lots of questions. Uh, and that way Stephen uh, can ask me all, all of your questions, and we can do everything we can to help you in this webinar. Because really uh, we're here for you and, and to help you uh, have a better understanding of, of this process. So what is a capital campaign? Uh, Bob Duncan has probably the, the most simple, uh, elegant definition of a capital campaign. It's a large dollar goal times, uh, or, uh, against a very short time frame. So big money in very, very short period of time. And uh, more specifically though, a capital campaign is a very intensive, highly coordinated fundraising effort. You're going to put together an army of people together and coordinate uh, the group of people through the capital campaign process and help them move forward. The reason you're putting this army of people together and going through, it's almost like setting up a separate organization when you're running a campaign for, for just a short period of time, is because you have a very large goal 
typically three to ten times the annual income of your organization. And so this is substantial money for nonprofits uh, to raise in a very short period of time. And, this last, and, and then point three is that it's over a, a defined period of time. Typically a capital campaign will run at the shortest, uh, probably 12 to 15 months. Um, but campaigns are, can go as long as four or five years, depending on, on the structure of the campaign, how big your goal is, and, and what you're trying to accomplish in that campaign itself. Now what types of campaigns are out there? Well, uh, campaigns have a, have a number of goals that you can go for. And, and the most common is probably bricks and mortar. Getting a larger facility, adding on to your current facility, remodeling, um, acquiring property, that's usually the, the most common. But campaigns can also be used for a number of other, other means that, that people don't recognize as much. Uh, sometimes they can be used to expand a program, um, or you can add funding to actually help. Uh, you want to do some bricks and mortar, and then you also want to do uh, some, some program upkeep or some uh, cash reserve, uh, upgrade equipment um, to, to do endowments as well. And so once again, it's that large capital goal or that large dollar goal that really defines what a campaign is. And ultimately, the goal of the campaign is to provide better services to more people. And, and really, no matter what nonprofit we are, we are working in, um, our ultimate goal is we're, we're serving people in some way, form, or fashion. Uh, e even in an animal shelter, seemingly the animals are the beneficiaries, people are also those beneficiaries. And so the goal is to improve those services to whoever, whoever values those services and what they're going to do. So let's get right into uh, the, the four mistakes that I see nonprofits make and, and in the way that they approach uh, fundraising. And one of the, the very first mistake is that I see that they, they expect uniform gifts. And the most easy way is to say, well, if we need to raise a million dollars, let's get a thousand people to give a thousand dollars. Or sometimes I'll see, you know, let's let's get a hundred people to give ten thousand dollars, and 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 we'll find that. And really, that doesn't work. It's not it's not an effective strategy. Uh, and, and 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 to some of us who are who are veteran fundraisers, we knew know this. But there's a lot of board members, and there's a lot of volunteers, and there's a lot of um, lay fundraisers and newer fundraisers that haven't quite experienced this yet. And so the let's, let's spread out the dollar amount um, so that it's equal to everyone. That, that's the best way to do this. And, and why do we do this? I think it's because we want, we're really all about fairness. We want it to be equitable to everyone. But the problem with this type of situ, uh, solution, $1,000 from 1,000 donors to raise a million dollars, is twofold. Number one is it doesn't uh, rightly match the appropriate gift amount to the, to the individual or to the donor's uh, capability of giving and their interest in giving. And so there may be some donors who a $50 gift is the best that they can do to that campaign, and the $1,000 gift, they just can't touch it, so they're not going to give to you. There may be other donors that have the ability to give you a $100,000 gift or a half a million dollar gift, but you're asking for 1000 and so then you're asking for less. The other problem with this type of strategy is that when you're asking for many, 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 many gifts from many people to, uh, for very large dollar amounts, the problem with doing a strategy like that is that it's incredible amounts of work to go out and find 1,000 donors to help you with, with that can give $1,000. And so the structure of it is even more work than the classic capital campaign. So how do we do it in a capital campaign? Well, we'll go back to our friend the donor pyramid. And in the donor pyramid, I think, Stephen, can you see my cursor here? Yes. Yep, I can All see right. it. Okay. I'm, I'm still learning this webinar stuff. The down yeah, down beautiful. In the universe is anyone who might have interest in your organization, in giving a gift to your organization. And so in that universe then, um, what, what the goal is is to help get donors to uh, people from the universe to actually give to your organization. And what you see is that there's, very, very, there's many, many, many donors that give very small gifts, and there's, many donor, there's very few donors at the top. You can see the surface area of these lead donors. Um, there's very few of them. 
What's interesting, though, about the donor pyramid is that donors actually give in the inverse. I'm trying to get to the slide here in just a second. Okay, so that slide's not going to work. We'll try this other way. Um, what we'll actually see then, I'll just draw it. What we see is that donors will give in the inverse. And so when you're looking at dollars, you get a lot of money from very few donors. And at the bottom, you get a wee little bit of money from many, 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 many givers. And, and that's the way the capital campaigns are structured. And in, in, you've heard about this before. It's called the Pareto Principle, the 80-20 rule, where 20% of the donors give 80% of the money, or 20% of the volunteers do 80% of the work. And so we've heard of this before. It, it applies to capital campaigns as well. And uh, in fact, it, 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 more and more we're going in that way, where now it's not just 80-20, but sometimes 90-10. And I've even heard of campaigns now uh, down in, uh, I believe the University of Florida just did a capital campaign that was uh, 97.3. So 3% 3 of the donors gave 90% of the money for this multi, I believe it was like a billion dollar, $2 billion capital campaign. So um, that's the direction of this. So how, does it, how do you raise a million dollars? Here's a gift range, the start of a gift range chart. And what you see is the first, the very first gift that we need is we need one gift of $150,000. Now that's roughly 14% of the total goal. This gift is really critical. Um, and how you read this is the number of gifts you need, um, what is the dollar amount, and then how many prospects do you need? You need three people who have the ability to give $150,000. Statistically, one of those three who are interested in your program will actually give it. Um, dollars in range and then total dollars. This first tier, what you'll see here now, is nine donors are going to give 45% of the total gift. And so it's really important to be able to connect with the largest uh, donors and, and to be able to understand whether they have the ability to give and whether they have the interest in giving. I had um, the unfortunate uh, circumstance of running, uh, working with an organization that wanted to build a pool. And uh, this, this group, um, they were very interested in building a pool, and so they had hired me to do a campaign uh, pre-planning study. Some of you have heard of that as a feasibility study. And when I came in to do the study, I spoke with uh, individuals who had the ability to give these types of gifts, these the very large um, either upper f uh, five-figure gifts or um, uh, lower to mid-range six-figure gifts. And while the community was very excited about a pool, and they had lots of surveys saying we should go forward with this pool idea, uh, the major donors were not a fan of the pool. And unfortunately, it shut down the project because we couldn't find the people at the top to give those, those dollar gifts. So as you move down the, dollar, uh, the, the, the gift range chart or the table of gifts needed, you can see that we go all the way down to um, we need 150 donors to give $250 each. And that, that gets us to our $1.1 million goal in this. But at the end, the most important gifts are these top gifts. If you can't get those very top gifts, the top 10 to top 15 gifts, you're not going to have a campaign. And so it's very critical to think about that and to make sure that you're not worried about equity, but you're more worried about um, making sure that you're asking for the right size of gifts for your, for your campaign. So the next, the, next, um, the next mistake that I said, you heard me allude to a pre-planning study, a campaign planning study. And the next mistake that I, that I see is actually skipping the campaign study. And what a campaign study is, is uh, you hire a consultant, and yes, I realize that I am a consultant, so um, there may be a couple people that think that's self-serving, but really it's a, it's, it's a research project that needs to be done prior to a capital campaign for probably 90 to 95% of, of organizations. And uh, the, those that fit into the 5 to 10% typically are very, very sophisticated fundraising operations uh, like very experienced universities that, that know their donors extremely well, have um, uh, giving officers in the range of like 100 in their development staff. And, and those, some of those organizations can skip uh, the study. But 
the capital campaign planning study or feasibility study is a critical aspect of, of, um, of a capital campaign. And here's what campaign studies do. First of all, they test the case. You're able to ask the question, do, do people resonate with this, with this case, with the project that we're trying to do? Um, is it compelling? Is it something that is, is exciting and that donors resonate with? Uh, when I had mentioned the pool, um, unfortunately the major donors did not find the pool so, uh, as something that's compelling, even though they had the capacity to get. Um, so really finding out who is the case compelling is something that's really important and how to structure that. There are other projects that um, as you go through you find out, wow, there's just overwhelming support for this. They're really excited about the case. The next thing you're looking for is um, assessing the capacity. So financial resources are out there to be given to this campaign. So for that million dollar goal, um, who has the capacity to give a $150,000 gift? And really looking at that population and finding out who has the ca capacity and who has the inclination as well. And, and really gauging that to be able to see, do we have enough donors and do we have donors of sufficient capacity to be able to reach the goal. And the reason this is important is, is that within that study, at the end of the study, once the research is done, um, your consultant will come back to you and give you some pointers, give you some suggestions, and be able to say, you know, I think that a million dollars is a little bit steep. Maybe we should go for three quarter of a million. Or they might say, you know, I really think you should go for two million. I think we should add an endowment to this because when I'm looking at the capacity and the interest, they're really, this is a campaign that's really going to go well. The third thing that the, case, uh, the, the campaign planning study is looking for is leadership and who will lead this campaign. And campaigns, capital campaigns specifically, are best run when they're run by volunteers. And specifically when they're run by volunteers who our peers or in that cohort group that have the capacity to give a top 10 gift. Because it's much easier for um, Phyllis to talk to Hazel and uh, Phyllis on the, on the steering committee to talk to Hazel and say, you know, Hazel, I have, uh, I put 100,000 of my own money in this. Would you give a gift of 75,000? Then it is for a staff person who doesn't really have a relationship with with um, Phyllis and be able to, to ask that question uh, of her and say, would you give a $75,000 gift? Uh, when you're asking from peer to peer, while technically the ask may not be as elegant, it's certainly much more effective when it's a peer to peer situation. The other thing is, is that when you're adding, uh, a lot of times staff don't have the ability, um, the, time, the time ability to do as much work as needs to be done. Certainly, we want to have the staff involved, uh, the executive director, the development director, if there is one, and, uh, and other staff people as, as possible. But you definitely need to find out who are the people that are the best to provide that leadership. And here's the key question that I ask when I do a, a campaign planning study. I ask, who can you think of that if they were part of this campaign, doggone it, it's going to succeed? Because there are certain people that come to, come to mind that, you know what, if, if, Harold, if Harold and Millie are, are leading this campaign, the community is going to be behind it, be behind it. And if they're not part of the campaign, you're not going to be likely to get the community to come with you. And there are certain thought leaders and influencers that, that have that capacity. And so who are those people for your campaign? The final thing that uh, we evaluate in a, in a planning study is how ready is your organization to succeed? in this campaign. Uh, campaigns are kind of like running a marathon. And if I were to say, um, we're going to have a marathon tomorrow, uh, are you ready to run it? Well, many may not be ready to run a marathon tomorrow, and myself included. But if we said we're going to run a marathon in a year, then uh, perhaps you might be better to do that. And so checking that readiness to make sure that you are ready for the marathon that is the capital campaign is uh, something that's really important and making sure that you have the systems that either can be um, fixed while we're in the middle of the campaign or that um, maybe delaying a little bit so that your organization can be stronger is, is, is a good step. 
Uh, the final real benefit of a capital campaign is um, that, or of the planning study, is that the planning study can help prepare your donors and your leadership for the campaign itself. It gives those donors the opportunity to start thinking about your campaign and thinking about their gift in an environment where they don't have to worry about being asked right away. And so they can start getting excited, getting interested, and moving forward with that. And so it's a, it's a really valuable tool that uh, is very important to be done. So we're about halfway through the mistakes that I've seen nonprofits make. And I'm hoping that you're thinking of some questions right now. And so I want to encourage you um, in about 15 minutes we're going to start taking questions. And so I would encourage you to start putting the, your questions into that chat window so Stephen can start organizing them and getting ready. Um, and uh, Leah just asked, um, what is the study called? It's called a pre-planning study or a feasibility study. And by the way, feasibility a feasibility study is kind of going out of popularity as far as the term. And the reason is, is that most nonprofits, they don't want to know whether the project is feasible or not. They want to know how to do it. And, uh, and so um, many nonprofits are going to go forward whether the consultant thinks it's feasible or not. They want to know how to structure it, and they want to know what the goal should be. And so pre-planning study is really a much more appropriate um, statement to go. All right, um, the next mistake is going public too soon. And uh, this is a mistake that um, makes me smile and makes me sad all at the same time. Uh, I was driving up to, I have a capital campaign that I'm leading up in Bemidji, Minnesota uh, for an art center. And I was driving up there and uh, I drove through Duluth, Minnesota. And as I was driving through Duluth, I saw a thermometer on the wall. And I wish I would have had the chance to take a picture of it. But it literally was at 10 degrees. And uh, we're throwing a campaign. And, and they even said their goal was $2 million and it had 10 degrees on. And I don't know any thermometer that's exciting when it's at 10 degrees, whether it's a real thermometer or uh, that actually takes temperature or whether it is a thermometer that is for a capital campaign or any campaign for that matter. It's just not very exciting. And so when you think about you know, a $2 million goal or a $5 million goal, and uh, we have, we have 50000 in the bank already, and we're raising $5 million, donors look at that and they say, well, what is my $1,000 going to do when you don't have that money? Whereas when your thermometer looks like this, we're raising $2 million. We got 75 of the goal in already. We need everybody to come and give, put their pennies together. We need every brat fry, bake sale. We need donors to give their $1,000, their $5. We need everyone to get involved and do a great big push for, to go public. Then you have that psychology. You have that excitement that, that really can bring a campaign. So let me take a minute and walk you through the steps, uh, the phases of a campaign because uh, capital campaigns are one of the few areas in fundraising that there's really, uh, they're very structured and very regimented. And, and, and almost every campaign goes through the same steps. Um, whereas annual giving, you know, the number of letters you might send, or there's a lot of variables within how you do annual giving or online giving or any of those types of things, events management, they're all different. Capital campaigns tend to be very, very similar. So let me walk you through those steps. The first step is to do the pre-planning. And uh, pre-planning is, is, really um, is really the process of getting ready to get ready for the campaign, if that makes any sense. And so this is pre-planning is the two to three years um, prior to the campaign itself and, and getting, getting, getting your organization ready. That might be preparing your architectural documents. It might be doing your strategic plan. There's a number of things that you do in that pre-planning phase. Then you enter the planning phase. And the planning of the campaign is when you do your planning study, your campaign planning study. And uh, that's when you, you usually will bring on um, counsel, retain a consultant who can help you through that campaign and walk you through that planning, planning stage, do the study, and say, I think this should be your goal. I think this is who your leadership team should be and how you move forward. The next step is when you actually start doing fundraising. And that's called the quiet phase. And in the quiet phase, you are taking um, very quiet efforts to raise 
between 60 and 80 percent of your goal in cash or pledges. You're meeting with those who would, if they could, uh, give a top 10 gift and asking them for the big money, so a six-figure gift, an upper five-figure gift, um, sometimes a seven-figure gift. You're asking those donors to give big money. And you're hoping, you're, what you're doing is you're working quietly to raise that thermometer so that when you go public, when you go out to the community, you've got 60 to 80% of the goal already achieved. And that's a statement to the community that you are ready. So that's what that quiet phase is all about and how that quiet phase works. Once you have the 60 to 80 percent, then you enter the public phase. And you do that by going public or, or launching the campaign. And, and now, um, now you've, been, you've been quiet for many, many months. The quiet phase could last six to nine months, sometimes 12. But you've had this quiet phase where you don't even have press releases about doing a campaign. You're not talking to the community about a campaign. You don't have any brochures or literature. All of a sudden, there is an explosion of energy that goes out to the community and says, we're having a campaign. We are raising $2 million, and we've got one and a half in the bank. We need everyone to come out and help. You, do a, you might do a um, press conference. Uh, you might do a big kickoff event. Uh, you might have army, an army of, of, of um, uh, teams, of fundraising teams going out to meet with different groups. You have a lot of public presentations that go and meet with church groups and social service groups and work groups and employers and employees and grants, all this um, um, flurry of energy that happens in the public phase. And most people think that once you reach your goal, the campaign is done. But I think there's a, there's a final phase to that that I think is really important, and that is the celebration phase. Celebration phase is when you throw, um, there's a couple things, but number one, you, you throw a big party that's appropriate for your organization. And um, so for if it was a boys and girls club, you might throw a community carnival um, and invite, invite the community down to the new center to see the facility and there would be games for kids to play and music and, and popcorn and other types of things for the community to come. And really the reason that you're doing this celebration is a fewfold. Number one is you want to thank the donors for their support. And you want to show them what you did with their, their, their support, what you did with their gifts, how you were a wise steward of the, the resources they trusted to you. You also want to show to your community that your organization is a success. It's a great big PR opportunity to marry your organization with the concept of success. So when they think of your art center, when they think of your environmental center, when they think of um, the the school that you run, uh, or the homeless shelter that you operate, they think, wow, what a great organization. They did an awesome job with their campaign. They have a beautiful facility, and I really want to continue supporting them. And that's the final reason that the, the celebration is really important, is that it's an opportunity to continue stewarding the relationship with those donors, because research shows that capital campaigns, well run, will actually boost annual giving over time. And so your annual giving will improve if you steward those donors right. And the celebration is a great tool to steward the donors and start the process of, of bringing annual gifts in. All right, That's, that is, so um, mistake three is going public too early. And here's the last mistake. And this also has to go with timing. And the last mistake is launching your campaign prematurely. I've seen a number of organizations that have launched early or, or, um, or they weren't ready to launch. And, and really, a bad campaign is worse than no campaign. Because just like you want to come out to the community and demonstrate we're successful, we did it um, to the community, you don't want to go and launch a campaign and then fail because that marks your organization with failure, and we don't want to do that. That's not a good brand for your organization. And uh, I'll remind you that um, brand is not just your logo and what you put out, but it's um, the total sum of the stories of everyone in the community that think about your organization. So what I have here is I see really two types of organizations out there. There's an organization that 
has, that lives in what I call the campaign cycle, where they live for a long period of time with no campaign. No campaign, no campaign, no campaign. And they really are not thinking ahead into the future. And all of a sudden one day, oh my goodness, we, we're, we're overwhelmed. We're slammed. We need to do a campaign. And we need to get going with our capital campaign. And they find wow, our donor base is not in the right, our donor systems and our development systems are not in the right shape. Our, our case is just really not well set, set up. Uh, there's a number of problems that come in with that. And so there's, a, there's an alternative, and this is what I see um, as, as, a, as a better alternative. There are organizations out there, though, that work under our growth cycle. And, and they assume that, you know, we're going to continue to grow. We're not quite sure when our next campaign is, but we're going to grow. We're going to take the time. We're going to plan ahead. And so these organizations, they start with a plan, and then they move into a preparation stage. So they say, in three years, we're going to launch a capital campaign. Therefore, we're going to get our donor database in order. We're going to work with um, expanding the number of donors that we have. We're going to beef up our PR. Uh, we're going to improve our board members, and we're going to get everything all set. And then we're going to launch the campaign. And we'll go through this growth phase right here. And we're going to grow for a period of time. And after you grow, then you enter into sustainability phase. And each of these phases, you are planning ahead. And so in, in the prepare phase, you are assuming that after the campaign is done, we're going to have to keep this thing sustainable. And as you're in the sustain phase, you know, we just finished a capital campaign, but we're getting ourselves ready for the next one because, you know, maybe it's 10 years down the road, but we're thinking ahead so that when, whenever that demographic grows, whenever the need increases, when the environment changes, we're ready. And that's something I think the hallmark of a really strong organization. So I have, um, I have a pre-campaign checklist that um, I, I, I produced for nonprofit organizations that um, are thinking about doing a campaign and want to avoid this trap of launching prematurely. And so this checklist is available to you. Um, if you go to my website, newdaynonprofit.com, and if you sign up for my blog in the upper right-hand corner, I will send you the checklist. And so um, I'm happy to give you the checklist. The checklist itself goes through and um, talks about, and I think I need to go one more slide, um, six different areas of preparation. And the first area is do you have a strategic plan? And what is your strategic plan say? Uh, do, you have a, do you have a track record of actually implementing or creating goals and then successfully implementing them, successfully achieving them? It also goes through fundraising. You know, for example, do you have a good relationship with your top 50 donors? If you don't know who your top 50 donors are and have uh, good notes on your top 50 donors um, in your donor database, if you don't have uh, minutes, if you haven't talked with them and, and done donor reports, then you might not be ready for that campaign. You should make sure that you're ready with that. If your fundraising systems, like your receiving systems, are not in good shape, might not be time. Staff. If your executive director is likely to retire in the next year, it might not be time for a capital campaign. Um, if you don't have the right executive director, it might not be time. So it's making sure that you've got the right staff people in place. If your development director is not there yet. Um, I have one organization that I'm working with right now that um, they have a very young development director. In fact, um, um, he was just hired three months ago. And uh, this is his first fundraising job. Very, very capable young man. But I advise the organization not to move forward for um, a year so that they can really solidify their, um, this, this young man and um, their, their executive director. And so I'm going to be working with them and coaching them through these stages to help them strengthen their organization and get their staff up right so that when they hit the campaign, they do it very successfully. Is the board right? Do you got good board members on the board? Are they engaged? Are they all giving? Are they um, the types of board members that can be helpful in a campaign itself? So planning that ahead is really helpful as well. So this is as much a checklist to help you, um, it's as much a checklist to help you understand what you need to do to be ready as a checklist to say, are you ready? Um, is the project well developed? Do you have a budget for the project? Do you have a budget for the organization once it is 
um, once your capital campaign is done and you built your building, do you have a budget, a pro forma for the next five years or ten years? Then finally, um, council, capital campaign council. Have you started to talk with the different capital campaign consultants to find the right one for your organization? It's important to, um, to start talking, especially, right, especially before you launch into your campaign. As, as you get to know the folks that are the right fit for you and for your organization, um, you'll be very comfortable moving forward with that campaign council and asking them questions. And sometimes you can even get free counsel from them um, on a limited basis, but sometimes they can help you get started as you're moving forward. And so really connecting with the right counsel, I think, is, is, is wise um, for your organization. So please um, uh, sign up for my blog at newdaynonprofit.com. Um, upper right hand corner and I will be happy to send you a copy of the uh, campaign pre-planning checklist and I'll do that next week Wednesday. So anything, anyone that signs up by Wednesday, uh, they will get that campaign checklist. Um, one more uh, recommendation and then after that I'll take your questions. Um, I have a book recommendation for you, uh, Capital Campaign Strategies That Work, uh, the third edition uh, by Andrea Kilstead. Uh, this is, in my opinion, the book. There are lots of books. I have a shelf of probably 20 different capital campaign books out there. This is the one. So if you're going to buy one book, this is a buy. Uh, yes, on Amazon it's $65. Or sometimes it's up to, I've seen it up as high as $80. Uh, you're going to invest a lot of money in a capital campaign. Uh, likely um, anywhere from uh, $50 to $200,000 in fundraising itself. So um, it's, a, it's a book that's only $80. When you think about it, it's well worth the expense. It takes you through step by step. It's very clean. I think Andrea does a phenomenal job. And uh, no, I don't get any proceeds from the books that um, I promote for her. Uh, I just really like the book. So uh, with that, uh, Stephen, do we have questions that I can help yeah, you with? Absolutely. Well, thanks, Brent. That was really awesome. Uh, hopefully everyone enjoyed that as much as I did. Uh, great information, and I think you really got people's uh, uh, juices flowing because we have quite a bit of questions. So thanks for, to everyone who sent a question in uh, and was a good sport about that. And Brent, I'll just kind of go through these from the, uh, from the top here. Um, so let's see. Um, we've got a question here from Sarah. Uh, Sarah's wondering how you approach corporate partners uh, in order to uh, expand outside your local market. So you know, what advice would you have for Sarah who's maybe wanting to approach uh, some some corporations for help with this. Well, Sarah, um, I think one of the first things to be reminded of is that uh, when you look at the total dollar amounts that corporations give to the philanthropic sector in comparison with all the other entities, and so when you take all the non-government money that was transferred from um, some other sector to the to, um, to the nonprofit sector, corporations only gave 6%. Hmm. And when you look at individual donors, they gave 80, roughly 83% when you include um, uh, bequests and, 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 and um, estate gifts and planned gifts. And so one of the first things that I think is important to consider is that um, corporations are not in the business of giving money out, they're in the business of making money. And so that's why they only give 6%. So be very cautious as to how much energy you put into them. Now there's certain businesses that you may have corporate in your city that may be willing to give a, give a significant gift. And in those cases, um, uh, it's important that you understand, number one, um, is the philanthropy of that company a good fit for your organization? If you're a faith-based organization, don't apply to Target. You're just not likely to get support from Target if you're faith-based because that's not what they're into. If they're into education, if you're an education organization, Target might be a great place to apply to. Um, if you're faith-based, though, Walmart might be a great place to, to apply. Now, the thing that you need to understand, though, is Walmart is in every city in the country, literally. And so you may not get very, very large gifts from Wal the Walmart Foundation unless you have, for example, a distribution center locally or a large volume of volunteers involved or um, if you happen to be in Bentonville, Arkansas. 
Um, other than that, you need to be very, you may not, it may not be a wise investment of your time. And so really the first thing that I recommend is go to the corporate website and really look at what they give to and what they're interested in. Often uh, corporations will have their own um, foundation and uh, foundations happen to have 990s. Um, and so go to that foundation's 990 and take a look at uh, what their giving has been and what their types of gifts have been and you can um, do some research that way as well. So those are some those are some strategies to get involved. The other thing is is uh, find a local champion within that business. Uh, the more employees you can have involved in your campaign, the better. And um, if you can find a local champion, a, um, uh, a the local district manager or the local vice president or local president or um, some sort of C level employee, chief financial officer, chief operating officer, um, chief marketing officer like Stephen is, uh, someone like that um, to really be a champion for your organization within their company, that's another good strategy because then they can help make the phone calls that can get you around some of the um, gatekeepers. Great. So I hope that helps you, Sarah, uh, with corporate questions. What's cool. next, Stephen? We've got a question here from Connie. Um, what about startups and capital campaigns? So a very new nonprofit, perhaps a very small nonprofit that's just getting started. Are, is, cap is a capital campaign something that's feasible for them? Is there a certain you know, minimum age of a nonprofit before you should start thinking about this kind of thing? What would you say to Connie about being a startup nonprofit? Well, Connie, um, startups and capital campaigns are especially hard. <laughs> um, it certainly is not undoable though because how does a homeless shelter start and get a facility if it doesn't do a capital campaign to raise the money for the facility? And, and so when you think about something like that or a museum that opens for the first time. So there usually is some, some form of large capital drive at the beginning for a, a non nonprofit. Uh, that said, they are very tricky. They can be a lot of work because you're not only building a nonprofit, but you're also building a capital campaign. And like I said, when you're running a capital campaign, it's like running two organizations. Now, that said, I'm not trying to scare you. And I'm not trying to tell you that they can't be done because they can't. And I've seen seen examples of that happen successfully and uh, really develop the, the organization. It's very important though that um, number one, I think it's critical that you get counsel mm -hmm. and uh, have capital campaign counsel walking with you through that. And actually it's a really benefit to have counsel in that case because the consultant can not only give you some counsel on how to run the campaign but how to set up your organization and really get that going as well. Um, it's also important to get some really um, significant champions at the beginning. And so that's where some of those large donors, if, if you have some large donors, you know, the, the philanthropists in the community behind your effort and behind what you're doing, um, then your campaign is likely to succeed and your nonprofit is likely to succeed as well. Uh, there's a local example in Eau Claire of um, the Eau Claire Children's Museum started with a capital campaign. Um, uh, Pat Redman had a, had a vision of, of getting this done and he connected with some um, various uh, very influential and um, high capacity donors and said we need a children's museum. We, we got to have a place for kids to go and learn and to play with their hands and, and, and grow. And they, they went ahead and they launched a great campaign. They had the right people. They had the right systems. They, they, they just did a, a bang up job of their campaign. And the Children's Museum has been going strong for five years. And five years into their history, they, they launched a second capital campaign mm -hmm. to expand um, and, and launch into their second floor. So it certainly can be done, Connie. Um, I think this is where wise counsel is really important. Um, it also is a lot of determination, as you know, when you're starting a nonprofit. Great. We've got a, a comment and a question here from Angela. Angela loved what you said about mistake number two, um, but she's having trouble, it looks like, getting some buy-in uh, from, from maybe a boss or a higher up about the need for, for pre-planning. What advice would you have for someone who agrees with everything you said, Brent, but, but needs to get buy-in from the top on this kind of thing? About the planning study specifically? Yeah. Skipping the, the need for pre-planning. Um, I think the, the importance of, of that pre-planning study and, and really getting, um, getting that, that part is, is one of the things that um, 
you share with, number one, you can share this video and, 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 and walk through that and be able to say, hey, take a look at this. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is I think Andrea's book does a really nice job pointing that out um, uh, and explaining why that study is so critical. By the way, um, I have an article, Angela. If you want, you can send me an email um, and um, sign up for my blog. And if you send me an email, though, Brent at NewDayNonprofit.com. Um, I'll just throw that up on the screen so you can get that. You if you send me an email, um, I will send you a campaign study article that you can share as well. That kind of goes through the explanation of why that's important. Um, Another thing that you can do, and this is something that's always wise to do too, is to talk to other nonprofits that have successfully led campaigns. You probably know of organizations in town that have done campaigns. Go talk to them and find out how did you do your campaign? Did you do a study? Did it go well? What went well? Why did you do the study? Did you find the study beneficial? And in most cases, you're going to find that there was a study involved. You're going to find some examples where there wasn't, but um, in most cases, you're going to find that that's there. Um, the last thing is, is that you know, sometimes um, set up a phone call with a consultant and, and, and your supervisor and have them talk to each other about that uh, because usually there's some questions that can be asked that can suddenly reveal, oh, we may not know as much about this as we thought we did. And, and that can be very helpful to, to that, um, be very helpful to that um, that leader and in pointing them in the right direction. So I hope that helps you, Angela, and uh, thank you for the compliment on, on uh, step two. I, I definitely agree. Well, here's one from Leah. Leah is wondering, uh, do you publicize all major donors? So she's concerned, what if two major donors are competing uh, in the sense that they may not contribute, uh, may not both contribute if they're aware of the other donors? Uh, contributions. So could you maybe shoot yourself in the foot by, by publicizing who's giving there? What are some best practices for actually making that information um, public? Well, when it comes to that type of situation, Leah, when um, you, know, you need to ask the question, you know, how much do you publicize these gifts and how do you recognize owners? Uh, there's two, thing, two answers that I have to that. Number one, that's the real value of having a leadership team of volunteers. Because that leadership team of volunteers are going to be able to speak to how to specifically address those types of situations in your particular community. And um, with, with the counsel of uh, uh, the leadership of a consultant who can kind of ask the right questions and, and, and draw that information out of your steering committee, the um, steering committee can tell you very specifically, yeah, you know, I think we should keep recognition quiet in this campaign and we'll do it this way versus that way or you know recognition let's let's go all out and let's you know in this community it's really important and we got to beat that drum hard and and get everyone so everybody knows that that um, Dan Watson gave a gift um, and they'll know based on that community's needs um, I work with uh, a lot of Christian organizations and um, a lot of the Christian organizations I work with don't want to do any recognition at all. And they're very quiet about that. And um, because of a faith, faith perspective, that's just not something that's consistent with their faith. And so um, they, they hold off. Whereas some of the secular clients that I work with, um, they are in some cases uh, very verbose. They really want to get it out. And so I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. The other thing is, is that there are certain donors that want to remain anonymous, and um, it's always wise to respect that, that wish and, and, and work within that. So I hope that helps you. Uh, Leah, if there's anything else I can help you with, please shoot me an email, and um, we'll let's talk about that. Cool. I think we've got about five more minutes for questions. So if, uh, if you've been sitting on your hands uh, and been too shy to ask Brent something, please do. We've got uh, about five minutes left for Q&A, and, and Brent, I'll just kind of keep rolling through these. Um, Casey here. Uh, Casey's halfway through our goal in a capital campaign. Good job, Casey. Uh, but they've hit a lull. Uh, how do we revamp the campaign or find fresh new prospects? So uh, they've hit a lull and, and need something to, to jumpstart that again. What advice would you have for Casey there? Well, Casey, um, what you are experiencing is what every campaign, just about every campaign experiences. You get about halfway through it and there's you know, um, almost similar to running a marathon. You're getting halfway through it and you just are out of breath. 
and you and you just you need to get that breath catch up and 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 reinvigorate. And so one of the things that can be is bringing the steering committee together and trying to find some easy wins. Are there donors that you haven't connected with yet? And in doing a um, doing an all out effort to to really get out and try to try to boost giving because what happens is success breeds success. So as you start bringing gifts in and um, as gifts start rolling in again, then that energy rein, reinvigorates and goes. Um, I don't know if you're retaining a consultant or not, but your consultant sometimes can um, help you in understanding when is the right time to start building too because sometimes um, the, the breaking ground can be really helpful in boosting fundraising as well. But um, you want to make sure you make that decision um, with counsel at your side because if you break ground too early, you can also really have hurt, up, hurt your campaign. I know another organization, I was not involved in this campaign, so I'll let you know that ahead of time. But I know another organization that they broke ground at about 50% of goal and they left at 60% of goal. And they still have 40% of their campaign five years later to pay off. And so they've got this debt that they're trying to pay off and they're just, um, it's just rough on them. And so you want to make sure that you go public at the right time. Um, while we're at it, um, on the screen, I have a free campaign checkup. And so whether you are planning a campaign, whether you're in the middle of the campaign like, um, like uh, uh, Casey is, um, or whether you're after the campaign and you want to talk about how do we get sustainability or you want to talk about that growth cycle and say, hey, we want to get out of the campaign cycle and go into the growth cycle, um, shoot me an email. And um, uh, let's talk. I'd be happy to do a quick campaign checkup, and maybe there's a couple pointers that I can help you in or point you in the right direction to help you move a little bit further faster. So I think, um, again, to just re recap, Casey, um, speaking with your campaign council, getting your committee, your steering committee, to really boost some giving and, um, and, and try to find the low-hanging fruit that's left. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of fundamentals and going out and trudging through and saying, let's make five more calls. And, and let's let's just try to get that 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 next gift in because once you get that a couple gifts closed, then you got that success to breed more success. Right, that's great advice. And we've got a question from Dana that kind of dovetails into that a little bit. Um, Dana's wondering how do you successfully extend a campaign? So she's got a match provider uh, that would like to increase the goal and extend the actual campaign. Um, any advice for Dana on actually doing that, extending the campaign? Well, what a great situation to be in, yeah. Dana. Wow. Um, I guess there's two ways to – there's two, two things. Number one, in the ideal situation, um, you have not gone public yet. Because when you go public, uh, that's when you announce your goal. And until you go public, your goal can be fluid. So if you have a $1 million goal and you haven't gone public yet, well, you just adjust the goal and you say, well, now we're $1.5 million because we got a $250,000 match. Mm -hmm. um, and so you just boost your goal up. Um, in, in another situation, though, when you have a match and they want to boost the goal, I, I think that's one of those where you have to communicate that well to your community. Um, your steering committee is, and you're going to hear some themes, you know, the, the consultant, the steering committee, the, uh, you know, and, and, and making sure you're checking with them. But verifying and speaking to your steering committee and getting very clear with them and saying, how do we raise this goal? And sometimes raising the goal means you go back to your top 10 donors and you say, thank you so much for your gift. We're so grateful for that. Something changed in the campaign and we want to really communicate this with you. And we'd like to ask your advice about what to do. There's an old fundraising adage that says, when you ask for money, you get advice. When you ask for advice, you get money. And so going back to those major donors and saying, hey, we have a million dollar gift that is available to us as a match and it came at the end of our campaign and we wanna, we're thinking about extending the campaign but we don't know how to do this, but we want to take advantage of this million dollars. Can you give us some ideas of how to make this happen? And engaging some of your top donors to participate in that and you may be able to do a second campaign somewhere in there. And so Dana, that I guess that would be my best, without knowing the details of yours, that would be my best um, um, thought is to go back to your steering committee and go back to your top donors, even some of those that have already given a gift. Because they got skin in the game already. They're very interested. They want to make sure the campaign is successful. So that's a, that's a way to get in there. So, Great. Well, we've got a question here. Um, Isaiah was wondering, what's the process of selecting a, a consultant? 
Um, and I know you're a consultant obviously, Brent, and I hope people will select you, but what tips would you have for folks who are maybe vetting you know, two or three candidates to help them out with this kind of thing? Yep. Um, and you said the name was Azale, is that right? Azale, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Hopefully I am. <laughs> Pretty close, okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So Azale, um, the, and, and I, I would agree with Stephen on that too. I hope that you select me as well. Um, <laughs> But, um, but when you're selecting a consultant, there's, there's a couple things that I, I really think is wise to look for. Number one is you want to make sure that you have someone that's obviously competent, who knows what they're doing and can do it well, um, and, and hopefully has a track record of success um, in, in what they're doing. Uh, the second thing beyond competency that you're looking for is what is the quality of service that you're going to get? How does that consultant treat you in the sales process? Um, are, they, are they persistent? Are they calling you back? Are they checking in with you? Um, are they polite when they do that? Um, because that's the type of service that you're going to get um, when, you are, uh, when you are working with them later on, hopefully. And so you want to make sure that they're persistent because a good can, capital campaign consultant is going to be pushing you throughout the campaign and will be calling you regularly. And if they can't do that in the sales process, um, they're not going to do it during the campaign. Um, the next thing that uh, I think is really important when you're looking at a consultant is checking the references, making sure that this person is um, good to work with, that they have great skills, and checking in with them. And then the final thing that I think is really critical and, and uh, I think, frankly, under underappreciated is do you like the consultants? So once you have verified that they're qualified, they're going to provide great service, that they have good references, at the end of the day, do you like this person? Do you re respect him or her? Because if you don't like them, if you don't respect them, even if they're qualified, it's going to be a rough experience. You'll be working with your consultant anywhere from uh, 15, 12 to, 12 to 36 months, somewhere in that range, um, 12 to 24 months. If you don't like them, that experience is going to be really miserable. Yeah. The other thing is that, because you'll be working closely with that person. The other thing, though, is that uh, in virtually every campaign, there's a moment where the consultant is going to come to you as, as the staff liaison of some sort and say, there's a problem, and the problem is you, and we need to talk about this, and we need to fix it. Mm -hmm. That conversation is not going to go well if you don't respect the consultant that you're working with. They may be very talented, but if you don't like them, you're not going to listen to that counsel that is helping you in a constructively critical way. And so finding someone that you can say, yeah, I could receive criticism from this person because I guarantee you it will come. There will be moments where there will be tense moments in that campaign. And the consultant is going to have to step in and say, you know what, I've got to work out the relationship between you and the chair. Or we, you know, sometimes you just need to watch your temper. Or sometimes we've got to work on this. Or this is, this is something that's got to be better organized. And, and that just is in every campaign part of that process of learning and growing and getting better. And because campaigns are so intensive, they tend to highlight our flaws. And so being able to work with someone who you can trust, who you like, and who you can um, understand will help you is, is really the way to go. So I hope that that helps you, Azel, in understanding how to select a consultant. Cool. Well, great. I know there are a few questions that we didn't get to, and we're running close to the 2 o'clock hour here. Um, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time, especially if they haven't had their lunch. So, Brent, I'm going to give you the last word to just tell folks again how they can get in touch with you. I, and I hope some folks will take advantage of, of the offers that he's made here. Um, but, Brent, how can people get, get a hold of you to talk more about this? Well, the best way to get a hold of me is by email. And uh, Brent at NewDayNonprofit.com. Uh, shoot me an email. And I, I'm offering a free campaign checkup to anyone who's on this call. And it's, uh, we'll talk for 45 minutes or an hour about your campaign, answer your questions in more detail, uh, and really get into uh, understanding how to, how to help ensure that your campaign is more successful. And so if I can help in any way, let me know that. Um, I also just want to plug my, my blog one more time. Um, I have a lot of helpful tips. I'm not real annoying. I'm not going to send you something um, every day. It's, it's usually one or two, sometimes three 
um, um, blog entries a, a month. And, um, and so just go to NewDayNonprofit.com, my uh, website, and on the upper right-hand corner, click blog, and it'll, it'll take you to signing up. And from there, if you sign up by next week, Wednesday, I'll send you that pre-planning worksheet as well. So cool. uh, thank you so much. And um, I really appreciated the opportunity to share a little bit about campaigns. And, and I hope that this is helpful in preventing uh, those four mistakes because if you watch out for those four, uh, you have a significant, significantly improved opportunity to have a successful campaign and grow the impact of your organization. So thank you. Well, thank you. I mean, you're the one who uh, shared all this knowledge with us for an hour, so really the, we owe you the thanks. Um, and thanks to everyone else who attended and, and took an hour out of their day to listen and hang out with us. Um, we do do these webinars once a week. Um, we're actually taking next week off, uh, but there are some opportunities for you to register for a couple of webinars that we've got coming up here in May. Uh, we're going to talk about nonprofit compliance. We're going to talk about uh, video and infographic acknowledgments. We're going to talk about how to get your board to fundraise. So if any of those uh, topics look interesting to you, do check out our webinar page and, and register for those. They're totally free, uh, totally educational. Uh, we'll get some more expert advice like we did uh, from Brent here today. So with that, I'm going to say a final thanks to uh, everyone for joining us today. Uh, look for an email from me a little later on this afternoon. It will have the slides and a uh, full recording so you can rewatch this uh, if, if you think that's necessary. Uh, do reach out to Brent, take advantage of his offer, and uh, check out our upcoming webinars. So thanks again, Brent, for being here, and thanks to everyone for joining us. And we will talk to you soon. Have a great rest of your day.